Today is September 18th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 58. This week, we talk all about autonomous vehicles, legislation, autopilot gone wrong, and cars that will book you a massage. Plus, we dive in to the... I almost said drive in. We can do that, too, to the dark side of artificial intelligence. It's all on Human Factors Cast, and it starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Well, Blake, that only took five, six false starts. What are you, man? Six make a great, great one that you actually did. So, hey, I'm happy with it. Okay. Well, anyway, to our listeners, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf over there. Oh, yeah. Finally here after six starts. Six Nick, starts. how are you, my man? Well, aside from messing up the intro six times, which is a record for the show, I believe, uh, I'm good. Um, Blake, I, I got a question for you, though, before we really get into some of the some of the stories for today. I got to know, what's on your shopping list? Uh, usually just food items, right? So kombucha, chicken, that kind of stuff. Why? Well, the um, I, I got I to gotta talk about this. So the... Uh, the guys behind South Park, um, they uh, aired South Park's back on the air. And uh, let me let me just say, if you're a little sensitive to um, some of the jokes that may be on South Park, you may want to skip forward like 30 seconds. But uh, I was watching this episode, and their episode was all about Amazon's Echo. And uh, man, it trolled all Amazon Echo owners in probably the most epic way possible. They, they were... Uh, you know what? Hang on. I said 30 seconds. Let me play this clip and then we'll talk about it. Hang on. Alexa, add scrotum bags to my shopping list. So that was a, <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the many sayings that was on South Park um, this past episode. And, and uh, my, my echo is situated right near my TV. And it's always annoying when somebody on a TV show says something even remotely um sort of resembling the word alexa because she always gets fired off and and uh you know it's it, it always misunderstands but this episode of south park man they just were going to town with this and they knew they were trolling people and my alexa was going off left and right while this uh while this episode was uh going on and I, that I just is so crazy. I didn't know that it would even catch that from like a TV show, but I, I guess it happens with like Siri too. Yeah, and you know this this really got me thinking back to one of the episode or one of the uh, stories that we had on last week's episode about the uh, high pitch frequencies with uh, hacking devices. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, this could have been used for something much more malicious, right? So if they had said, you know, order pre order South Park uh, season eighteen or whatever they're on now you know, on Amazon, you know, then, then they could have made a ton of money just by <laughs> having it, you know? So there's, there's all these ethical issues with taking control of other people's in-home devices. And I, it was just one of those things that I'm like, you know what? I'm glad they used it for what they did because I can take scrotum bags off my shopping list very easily. But, uh, you know, canceling a pre-order for something is a lot more intense. <laughs> I'm just glad that they made an episode that did that because I mean I, I don't know it's that's just a funny way to get it get at people and most I mean, people probably wouldn't expect that to happen right yeah the whole premise behind the episode is that uh, Amazon Echo is taking people's jobs <laughs> and so <laughs> they get real people to sit in as the assistant <laughs> so uh, yeah I mean check it out if you're a South Park fan at all or, or enjoy that kind of television programming. Uh, check it out. It's it's worth it just for the laugh about uh, the Amazon Echo culture. Blake, what's going on with you, though? Oh, man. So over the weekend, I saw the new It, and I couldn't help myself but watch the 80s version and compare the two of them. And it was, it was just a, an interesting experience, I guess, uh, seeing the newer film because it was a lot more of a horror flick than the first one. Oh, yeah. And in a major way like from the design to it to the music that was used and this is the the big part that i noticed is that between like the 80s version versus today's version the 80s version had a much more creepy feel right like uh, it would 
play that kind of circusy piano every time Tim Curry would appear on the screen, whereas there's a totally different use of sound in the brand new version of it. It was much more like sound effects, like slamming or screeching noises. No, no real ambiance music to create the fear. And I just right. thought it was an interesting comparison about how uh, different how sound design can affect emotions you feel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I totally get that. Like, uh, we actually went to Halloween Horror Nights opening night uh, on Friday, and um, I yeah, there was a lot of sound design that went into those mazes as well. And yeah, it's uh, it's I was listening to a uh, an interview. I forget with who it was. Um, it was probably Star Wars or something. But there's you know <laughs> they're saying that using music or using sound is almost like cheating because you can evoke these emotions just by um you know just by the music and so it it's kind of an accompany accompaniment to what's on the screen and you can almost convey emotions just by the music alone and if the music is not congruous with <laughs> congruent with what's on TV then it's like you know what are you doing yeah, and that, it's funny you bring that up, too, because really what prompted me to see this difference is I had recently read, it, read an article, and I cannot remember the author's names, but it's uh, it's from, like, O'Reilly Media, so they're known for putting out, like, the different uh, usability books and all that kind of stuff, and this one was about sound design, and it was, like, a, a pinch from the actual book that's being released, and it was talking about sound design when you're making mobile apps or even uh, desktop software right like the importance of the sounds that you use to convey meaning and how if you don't properly like put any thought into the design and just kind of pick sounds willy-nilly you you never know what people are going to think i uh i think i found it here is it by amber case and aaron day yes that is very familiar that's definitely it that's the one all right well go check out that article uh you have another thing on here is this a is this a pitch what is this pitch? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if anybody is in the L.A. area on this Friday and you find yourself with either nothing to do or some spare time in the late afternoon and evening, there is a L.A. meetup uh, at a place called IDEAN. And again, I will tweet all this stuff out through my Twitter handle. But anyway, it's a networking talk and happy hour event, which is all about the role of design in the adoption of new technology. So basically, uh, how do you design for people to trust new technology, whether it be mobile apps or talking about the Internet of Things? Lots of great speakers, lots of chances to network with people and you know inter- intermingle with some of the folks in L.A. So if you happen to be around on Friday, come, uh, come say hi or come stop by. And again, I will tweet out the specific details on my Twitter just so everybody has it. Um, but yeah, yeah Friday. Come- Big talk. Come get some drinks and talk about uh, human factors and stuff. So Blake will be there. I will not be. But uh, in case you do want to hang out with us, um, this is exciting. So uh, we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but you can uh, we we set up a Slack um, account for our listeners because a lot of times uh, you know listeners just want to have a conversation with us and and uh, typically doing that through either uh, you know our social media channels. Uh, or uh, email it's a little bit difficult but when you know when you're on slack you can share uh, valuable resources and we can get a community going so we're really excited to uh, get that up and running and uh, you can check out the link is in the show description so if you go to that uh, you can hang out with blake and i on us our own human factors cast slack channel and uh, it'll be good times there uh, it's it's pretty empty now because we just started it, so please don't be discouraged if you join and no one's in there. We will get some listeners in shortly. All right, Blake, uh, do you have anything else before we jump into the news? Let's get into it, man. It's crazy week of news. Yeah, it is. All right. Well, I mean, it was a very busy week for automation, but let's... Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the news. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This could be anything from... well. It's not. This week, it's all about automation and self-driving vehicles and a little bit of hacking and AI. So let's get into it, Blake. What's up first? Yeah, all right. Let's dive into the hacking and AI first. So we all know we've pretty much reached an 
an era of AI, and it is definitely upon us. It is the cheesy, cheesy cliche goes, with great power definitely comes great responsibility, which in this case includes experimenting with malicious uses of AI or artificial intelligence. So over the last year, data scientists from Zero Fox, a security firm, have conducted experiments to see who was better at getting Twitter users to click malicious links, humans or AI bots. Researchers taught an AI an AI bot to study the behavior of social network users and designed it to implement its own phishing bait. The AI hacker was substantially better than its human counterparts at distributing around seven tweets per minute and luring a total of 275 victims through its phishing bait. In comparison, a human hacker was only able to pump out about 1.075 tweets a minute. That's just over one tweet. Yeah, just over one tweet per minute making just about 129 attempts and only luring 49 people. So thankfully, this was just an experiment, but this exercise shows that hackers are already in a position to use AI for nefarious ends. So I do have a comment about the human part as far as it being a human hacker. I I wonder if their definition of human hacker is somebody manually doing this, because I, f- I feel like most hackers could write a pretty substantial script that would pump out more content than just like one thing per minute. Oh, that's absolutely. Just, that's I, just me. I think this is, this comes down to content creation. So they are literally creating uh, tweets that entice users to click on it. Um, it's, it's clickbaity in nature and they're trying to get people to click on this uh, in order to fish their accounts. And the, the metrics here, the 6.75 tweets for the AI and the 1.1 1. tweet per minute for, for the human, I think those come down to content creation. So the human uh, takes about one minute to think of a tweet and type it out, and or at least that's my understanding. It could be that they already have these things um, pre uh, predetermined, but um, they just need to type it in and direct it, whereas the AI can do that so much quicker. Um, and I'm I'm really wondering if it if it comes down to content creation or if it if it does just have to do with distribution because there's a big difference there, right? Yeah, you're right. And you know, I think it has more to do with distribution uh, than it does content creation. Because I mean, I, I know I pulled this exactly from the article and it says just distributing. 6.75 tweets per minute, so maybe not as much of just creating the content itself right? Um, or focusing on that anyway. Yeah, and is it really AI at that point, or is it just a script? Because, I, you know... That is a great point, man, and I thought the same thing. Um, the only part that made me think it was an AI or that you could say that it was is that, okay, one, it's trolling to understand user behavior, and it's designed to implement its own phishing bait. Um Again, though, it's it sounds like just a script that's able to pump out X amount of pieces of content per minute to, I think I think the the length or the amount of people was about like 800 users. Um, but nonetheless, still something to be aware of if you're using social media and you are <laughs> clicking a lot of the URLs. It uh, it seems like it wouldn't be that hard to hop in there and use AI or a person just to hack it. Yeah, I'm I'm looking through the actual study here, um, and uh, you know we usually say this a little bit later in the show, but if you guys want to check out any of these articles as we find them, you can follow us all over social media, and uh, you know we post these as we find them. Um, but you can you can follow along on this uh, report here to see what we're talking about. Um, but I mean, they go into why they use Twitter um, and you know, why the, the methods that they used, uh, in case you're wondering why they use Twitter, it's a bot friendly API, uh, colloquial syntax, shortened links, trusting culture and incentivized data disclosure. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of reasons why they chose Twitter over any of this. It looks like they are, it might be, do it might be, um, so I think to answer our question, it might be due or it might be more, having to do with target acquisition. So actually automating who, you know, these, uh, oh, what, the, what these tweets are targeting, because I think from, from, at least from these examples, it looks like they are tweeting at very specific accounts and, you know, asking them to either sign in or, 
um, or, or, or you know, they're they're targeting who they're fishing, and I think that's where the human aspect fails is that they don't really have a reliable algorithm in our brains to target specific or or more likely uh, people to um, be vulnerable. So I think that's where it comes from. This this uh, article is really interesting. Now that I'm digging a little bit deeper into it, it's been about yeah. A, could- this this article came out a week ago, so I'm like I'm operating off of a week uh, a week displaced. But uh, go ahead, Blake. Sorry, I cut you off there. No, it's all good. So it was interesting because I, I remember last week I kind of asked myself about uh, an article similar to or a similar question to this, and I was like, why? It, oh, okay. So it was the a basically the what we were just talking about with virtual assistants and using the micro frequencies. I was like, why was somebody researching this topic? Um, and then again, I kind of felt the same way when I broached this article at first until I started getting deeper into the article, of course, and it has great reasoning for why to research something like this. And it's, it's basic tenet is if it's possible for a hacker to put AI together and use it against you, big security firms and even DARPA themselves or have been encouraging other companies along with their own internal company to perform this kind of AI as a like quote unquote weaponized thing that you can use because if you get if somebody puts like an adversarial AI within your own system and it starts tearing your stuff apart the only way you can even have a chance to fight back is to have your own kind of AI um, to help help you try and do damage control and push back a hacker out of your system Um, and (laughs) down here it actually talks about how DARPA organizes challenges like this in which they they put AI developers in like a basically capture the flag scenario where they compete against each other with their own types of AI that they've built. So there's there's a lot of utility in building something like this. So it was just kind of an interesting point because, again, I was wondering where did this line or thinking come from to do research on? Yeah, uh, just to, just to kind of round this out a little bit more. So they actually target specific hashtags. So they use the example cat. You know, after two hours, they had 17 people clicking through it. And after two days, they had uh, between 33 and 66% clicking through. And this was a uh, shortened Google link. Um, They also found that the Google uh, showed, you know, um, uh, you know, more, a, a better turnover rate. So, Check out this article. This is a really interesting piece and definitely a lesson in cybersecurity, uh, especially if we're using AI to outsmart us. Uh, yeah, there's the the HFES people. They, they Oh, speaking of which, uh, that is less than a month away. We'll see you there. Uh, <laughs> um, we got so much stuff going on. But yeah, so this is a really interesting article. Please go check it out. Um, and uh, Blake, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before we start moving on and talking about vehicles? Uh, no, the only closing thought I have is it's insane that because they use an image in the article of an actual tweet that was an AI, could be AI or could be a human. And it is definitely identical to what somebody would actually use yeah. that is a human. So very, very real possibility. Interesting stuff. Very scary. So Zero Fox, if you're listening, you can uh, you can try to fish us at hashtag HFCast. All right, go ahead. Next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on to the autonomous vehicle world. So last week on the show, we talked about the how, that the House of Representatives was passing a bill allowing the testing and de- deployment of autonomous vehicles. And this week, the Department of Transportation announced that it's working on version three of guidance for self-driving cars to be released in early 2018. Automakers and other players in the autonomous vehicle game have wanted the Department of Transportation to be clearer about the roles that states and federal governments played in regulating autonomous vehicles. This would help them determine whether there was a patchwork of state regulations across the U.S., which would inevitably make self-driving deployment much more difficult. So so we talked about this a little bit last week um, with the release of the House of Representatives bill over to the Senate that there was a major concern from automakers and company big companies like google or anybody that's really in the autonomous vehicle space that yeah. okay we're getting federal regulations but what happens when we go state by state so it looks like that's really 
so that's really what companies were looking for from this guidance and it looks like this the uh, dot is definitely delivering yeah this is so this is a 36 page document um and they they go into some of the seminal human factors research uh such as the, you know the levels of automation um and you know safety all this stuff and they they go over some of these guidelines uh and um guidance for automated vehicles and it's it's really interesting that the whole uh guidance document is available on that article from recode uh, definitely worth a check out but blake what are your main takeaways from from uh from this news uh honestly nick i was i'm a little confused about it because like you're like we're saying we're talking about a 36 page document here that's obviously had a lot of work put into it there is a ton of what looks like at least references to studies or at least data collected and talked about in here from everything from basic human machine interface to what we just talked about cybersecurity but within a vehicle but the thing that confuses me is all of section one and all of all throughout the article, this is voluntary guidance for each of the states, I'm assuming. Um, so I'm wondering how this gets actually implemented, or if it does, or what makes the decision for it to be implemented. Well, so, okay, so I'm looking at page 18 here, or I guess it's uh, on this uh, this document, I guess it's page 24 of 36. Um it says in HTSA strongly encourages states to not to codify this voluntary guidance. So don't that they're you know they don't want you to incorporate it into state statutes as a legal requirement for any phases of development, testing, or deployment of ASDs or ADSs. Sorry, allowing NHTSA alone to regulate the safety design and performance aspects of ADS technology will help avoid conflicting federal and state laws and regulations that could impede deployment. So it sounds like what they're doing is they're just saying, hey, um, don't use any of these as strict guidelines. Uh, we'll get you those later. But um, instead, these are these are more a rule of thumb uh, that you should follow just to be safe. Yeah, which is definitely good to have. I mean, especially especially with the big pro or the big question about what is the what becomes the driver's role in these cars based on the different levels of automation. So I I could see right. they've made like some concessions about like what you do if it's level three or lower for a human versus not. So it's, it's good to have this baseline stuff for states to build off of at least or understand. Yeah. Page 26 as well. They kind of break down um, the NHTSA's uh, responsibilities as well as the state's responsibilities. So the NHTSA, they are responsible for setting the federal motor vehicle safety standards. Uh, that's FMVSSS uh, for short to new motor vehicles and motor vehicle equipment which uh, with which manufacturers must certify compliance before they sell their vehicles. So they are establishing the standards. They are enforcing compliance within these standards, and they are investigating and managing recall and remedy of noncompliances to these standards and communicating with and educating the public about motor vehicle safety issues. Now, the states, they are more on the licensing human drivers side of things, which is interesting. Um, so they are setting the requirements for whether or not you need a driver's license to get into one of these vehicles. Um, which, jur which jurisdictions do you need for, you know, uh, where can these operate? Um, where, you know, what kind of traffic laws do automated vehicles have to follow? Um, so it sounds like this is, this is a really interesting piece as well as uh, so in addition to those two, there's also conducting safety inspections um, where states choose to do so and regulating uh, motor vehicle insurance and liability. So this is this is a really great breakdown of, um, you know, what is what at the, the federal versus the state level, um, you know, e each respective office is responsible for. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And it, it, they've even got some guidance about how to test this on public roadways. And that's going to be, it looks like, again, recommended that the permission be to test or be remained at the state level. Uh, so at least it, although that's probably not what big companies are hoping for, because it sounds like that's still a hurdle to hop through per state that you go to. Right. 
Um, at least it's clearly stated that that is, in fact, what they're what they're kind of pushing for. Yeah, uh, man, I I just I to all of our listeners, I can't recommend enough. Like, go go check out these articles. These are really solid articles this week, and there's a lot of really good documentation, especially if you're working in this field. Um, definitely something you want to go check out, even if it's just an interesting thing. There's these these uh, these big documents this week. They are in the original articles that we sent out as well. And so please do go check that out. Um, do you have anything else to add on to this one? Because we got a lot of uh, automation to, and uh, self-driving car stuff to talk about this week. Yeah, we sure do. Uh, no, not really, Nick. I mean, I think we can keep pushing on because the next story is pretty a pretty interesting tale. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we reported on this a couple weeks back, uh, a couple months back. Um, but, uh, why don't you jump into it there? All right. So we're getting into a little bit about Tesla. So this week, the national traffic safety board had stirred words for all parties involved in a 2000, 2016 crash that killed a man driving a Tesla model S and put their autopilots driving technology system under a pretty tense microscope from a hearing this week. The NTSB recommended that technology or that all automakers deploying level two autonomous driving tech, not just Tesla, should come up with better warnings and improved monitoring technologies to prevent them from being used irresponsibly by drivers. So if the NTSB's recommendations that they put out through this hearing are put in place, it'll help provide system safeguards, make standardized safety data available, and also improve the safety of partially automated vehicles for everyone who shares the road with them. So this is this has a lot to unpack, and what I wanted to do, Nick, is I tried to keep this as objective as possible. So I kind of broke down from the article each angle that this comes from. Yeah, but, I I see it. I, I really I really dig that uh, that distinction there. Yeah, because I, I don't know, I I I got a little bit misled reading the title of it, and I think uh, even the blurb we just gave it calls it out a little bit. Like this is this is like providing guidance for all automated technologies, and so I'm just gonna kind of hop in from the different perspectives. What has gone down, at least in the hearing for this? So sure. Based yeah. off the from the NTSB side of things, so Tesla allowed the driver to use the, in this case, it's their autopilot driving system outside of the environment for which it was actually designed. And so the system gave far more leeway for the driver to divert attention, do something uh, and do something other than actually driving. And so from the, the MTSB perspective, it looks like that contributed to the collision and just shouldn't have happened because we're, we're in this realm of deploying different levels of automation in cars. And so they have to kind of figure out how to regulate what people can and can't do. Right. So, um, so from their perspective, Tesla should not have even allowed the user to engage autopilot in this situation. Yeah, not in this situation and definitely not allowed, not allowed them to divert attention as much as they apparently did, according to reports. Now, my memory around this is a little fuzzy was... So I remember at one point Tesla didn't even require you to touch the steering wheel at one point when autopilot was going on. And I don't remember if that was if, if that change was a direct result of this incident where um, now they require you to touch the steering wheel every couple seconds or, or, you know, keep your hands on it or something while you're operating. Uh, and I, I don't recall whether or not that was directly... A result of this incident or not do you do you know anything about that blake no i don't know if it's a direct uh cause from this incident it would make sense but also i would assume that through research and test data over time that would come to light that you're you have a better chance of keeping people involved or people in the loop while driving if they have to like keep their hands at least on I the steering so. wheel uh, that may be, may or may not be the correct way to look at it but that's that's the only thing i know about this yeah, I'd, I'd hope so. Well, let's let's hear from Tesla. What is their perspective on this whole thing? Okay, so they definitely appreciate the NTSB's analysis of this tragic event, as they should, and they eval they're evaluating their recommendations to continue to evolve the technology. Um, but they want to be extremely clear that the current and potential customers that autopilot is not a full, and this is pretty important, not a fully self-driving technology, and drivers need to remain attentive at all times. And so it's 
it's the tricky place that I think most people are not going to know the difference between what we're thinking is autopilot and maybe what's true autopilot. Cause like yeah. referencing back to the start of the article, this is level two automation. This is not like something beyond level four where it actually is a full on autopilot car that wouldn't even require you to potentially interact with anything. Now, Blake, do you, do you foresee Tesla potentially? I know they have autopilot. I don't know if they have it trademarked or not, but I, I know it's their thing right? They have autopilot in ground vehicles. Now, I'm wondering if they are going to have to rebrand to not falsely advertise what that capability is meant to do, right? So are they going to have to say it's like driver assist or or something similar along those lines? Yeah, I mean... I, I would think they would need to because the mental model that comes with the word autopilot is very is probably very different uh, different and a little more futuristic than what is actually true in this case. And if they're not going to rebrand it that way, I mean, what the NTSB is recommending that warnings and improved monitoring that's got to be done if if they're expecting like okay, people are we're going to call this autopilot. We're not going to really. We're going to tell people that you have to be attentive, but they've they've got to provide extra safeguards for people in cars. Because, I mean, even now, without autopilot, I see people on their phones constantly. Like, it's hard enough for them to keep in check with their driving without something that's calling itself autopilot. Right, yeah. And I, yeah, you bring up a great point with mental models. I mean, to most people, autopilot means I don't have to do anything. And... It's just it's how do they, how do you comp they they can they can tuck the autopilot trademark if they do have a trademark I gotta look um, they can tuck that away and call it something else until they get to that point because that's they're working towards that but um, you know just the whole <laughs> there's this whole stigma associated with labeling things and it real like this is one of those cases where it really brings it to light, where you really have to be careful about what you call certain things in design because that's the way your users will see it. It's it's a it's an interesting problem and something that you don't think about until something goes wrong like this. Well, that's that's kind of again another great point and just to just to like give it from the guy the man's family who died in the crash's perspective like and this I found really interesting just because we are talking about like a, a potential middle m- mental model for what autopilot is. And they don't have they don't blame Tesla at all. I mean, they were getting they were hearing like from news headlines and whatnot that it was the car's fault. But apparently that just simply wasn't the case. Like they were he was using an autopilot peach autopilot feature. Yes, in the car, but he was operating it outside of its means and not paying attention when he was driving. So. I don't know. I'm at least like Tesla's had enough behind it to where they ha- they haven't like had to assume full fault for this situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's I'm really glad that you broke down um you know, the family's view, Tesla's view and the NTSB's view. Um I'm so really quick though. I am looking at Tesla's autopilot uh section on their press kit and they are they do define it as a level 2 automated system um and they they also say you know what kind of features it has right so auto steer auto lane change auto park uh summon and uh but it 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 really kind of it it it's using all these auto like auto shows up a lot of times on this and uh I'm I'm reading a little bit more in depth here. It says assisting in their control of the vehicle. It doesn't say, you know, driving. So it it's there but it's hidden and I don't know if that's something you want to be hiding from users where it could potentially save their life if their mental models are in um in line with, you know, what what the capability is. Yeah, and I totally agree with you, especially when we're talking about levels of automation that you know, it's not. I don't think it's generally clear unless you go and Google it yourself. But even then, you're going to come across a lot of different guidance. Have to really think about what you're reading. But just saying level two automation like that even rings some bells of like, oh, okay, well it, that's better than level yeah. one. 
must mean they can do greater things, right? To be, to be fair, they have a link to the NHTSA's website on Level 2 Automation. Um, but here's the kicker. It, it goes directly to um, press releases on NHTSA, but it, it's kind of like it's hidden, right? It doesn't give you Level 2 Automation articles on NHTSA. Um, it, it just, uh, although the, I, so I think the link is broken or it's not updated. So that's, that's something they need to fix. <laughs> Scoop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Answering, geez. Answering those hard hitting questions here. Detective work on uh human factors cast <laughs> Tesla. Fix it. <laughs> People's lives yeah, are seriously, at stake. Be, be more explicit about what's going on with your cars. Do we go over these faults awarded? Uh, no, I can hit them real quick if yeah, you want, for just it. for the audience. Okay, so basically at the at the end of the day, here's really what, what's going on. So the board faulted Brown, the driver, for not paying attention in the seconds before the crash, because again, he was using autopilot outside of its means, uh, but they also know that autopilot did not do an adequate job of detecting other traffic and did not inform the driver early enough to allow them for sufficient reaction time. However, something we haven't talked about is that is in this particular crash, it was a crash with another vehicle, and this happened to be a truck dry, a truck. So it from the NTSB's analysis and like critical incident reporting, they've deemed the truck driver likely could have seen the seen the car. So there's fault on both parties, right? And now here's a, a separate part of it, though. It's the fault on two different parties driving cars, but there's also now automation in the mix. So again, the need for this kind of legislation and uh, different ways to clear this stuff up makes more sense as time goes on for yeah. sure. Yeah, I brought it up before and I'll bring it up again. Who's it who you know who, who is at fault when um an automated vehicle crashes? Is it the driver? And I I love that we got into this a little bit today. But who is at fault? Is it the driver? Is it the system itself? And in this case it seems like you know both of them were uh were at fault here, but when you start getting into fully automated systems it's no longer going to be the driver's fault. So who gets sued in that case? Is it the company who developed the algorithms to do the uh, auto automated vehicles? Like, is it their fault? Or is it, does the driver assume some liability when they sign on for the autopilot program, whatever that may be? So there's all these legal issues that, you know, they have to consider too. And, um, you know, or if you really want to get weird, I mean, is it the, fault of the car with level four automation they got in an accident with somebody driving a regular car who's at fault there right or or if there's two types of cars with different varying levels of automation level two versus a level four like who's at fault there oh right? my goodness yeah it's like a so, bad interaction problem yeah it's just it there's so many things that need to be ironed out and this is just the tip of the iceberg and i'm i'm i hesitate to say i'm excited about automated vehicle crashing but i am interested and intrigued to see how we solve this problem well i think that's what i'm excited about is the on-road testing publicly in different states because that's the that's the only way these kind of problems are going to get figured out or even somewhat assessed is by doing more physical research out in the field now i'm not saying like oh just throw them out there and see if they run into people i mean it'll be likely very you know, very uh, tracked testing and how they're going to do it and have a lot of safeguards. But at the same time, you have to figure out these kind of just strange questions right now because we are for the interim and I don't know how long that could be. It could be 10, 20, 25 years. We're going to have like one through four and I guess zero levels of automation in cars. Yeah, it'll be. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. All right. Uh, let's get weird for a sec. <laughs> well, I guess not not. not not yet. I just, first, before we get weird, I want to thank our friends over at Tech Con TechCrunch, Recode, Gizmodo, and Engadget for all of our stories this week. Like I said earlier, guys, if you want to follow along with these stories as we find them, you can follow us all over social media for links to those original articles. You can dig deep into them just like we are. All right, Blake, now let's get weird. Yeah, let's get let's get real weird for a second here. So this week, Ford disguised a man. Let's say it one more time, they disguised a man as a car seat masquerading as a true self-driving vehicle. So why would Ford do this? You ask. Well, we ask the same thing, and mainly it's because 
Ford is still required to have somebody behind the wheel in real-world testing situations. But Ford also wanted to evaluate how passersby, other drivers, and even cyclists reacted to sharing the road with an autonomous vehicle that communicated actions through a light bar on the top of the car. The goal is the goal here was to continue this light signal research and work together with in, work together to define industry standards with other organizations to make communication between autonomous vehicles and other drivers more commonplace. And please, if you guys have it, if you check out one article this week, if it's only for the GIF in this one, please take a look at it because it is hilarious watching this guy like dress up basically as a seat in a car. Yeah, yeah. I I actually saw this a couple weeks back. Um, someone someone actually posted a video of this, but they didn't release anything about it. Um, and now they've released this statement. Um, and so uh, the piece I want to dig into with this is the communicating with the light bar. Um, I, how do you feel about this thing, Blake? Because I'm of mixed feelings on it. Um, well, I'm glad you have mixed feelings because I really don't like it. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I, good. That, that was kind of the only thing I could come up with. And, you know, I tried reading this article a couple of times to be like, okay, there, there's got to be a very good reason for going, going with this light bar idea. But I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get it. I just felt like you're going to have to make this so commonplace for people to understand what you're trying to convey. Uh, yeah. So like Blake said, if you check out one article, check out this one because it's hard to talk about this light bar without really seeing the patterns that it's emitting. And uh, it's it's left both of us scratching our heads uh, from what it sounds like. So some of the patterns, like I am literally scratching my head right now. Some of the patterns, I, it just doesn't make sense. It's not intuitive. It doesn't like as a as a pedestrian i wouldn't know what the intent of this automated vehicle is if i were just to look at this light bar now i think this study does have some merits right they are trying to check out the social cultural impacts of how we deal with self-driving vehicles and that is great in itself but when you're trying to I guess they're trying to maybe use this light bar as a communication device between the car and the pedestrians, but it matches no mental models that we have existing. We'd have to develop them. It's almost like developing an entirely new language uh, for the road that we just don't have that vernacular right now. So it's like, how do we even get to that point? Um, and maybe they were t trying different patterns to to illustrate different um, vehicle behaviors. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I, so I, I I hesitate to call it bad when you know they are trying different methods of communicating. So that's kind of where I stand. Like I think it's a good effort, but who knows. Who knows? Who knows how, how we can develop this? Go ahead, Blake. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You off. No, it's all good. So it, I definitely agree with you. It is not bad, and it is not a bad line of research. It's it's really actually pretty smart in two ways, right? Because like Nick said, they're getting at these like cultural implications of, oh, man, that car looks like it has no driver in it, because that's going to take some serious time to get over the shock of, right? And that's not only for pedestrians to adapt to, but drivers – uh, think about safety workers on the road. Lots of different people are going to have to just get used to it. And seeing this stuff up front is a great idea. I think, the it, again, I don't like the word bad here, but it, I don't really have any other way to describe it. I think the design of the light bar is just a little too familiar to things we see in other cars. So just picture you're looking at a car head on and in the windshield at the very top is probably what is likely two inches thick worth worth of like a light bar all across the top of the windshield or inside and it's inside the car color is well, white color is white yeah it's using white indicators and the problem here for me is this it, it, not in the specific car model they use but you see these actually in the front and back of undercover cop police cars so you, i would assume that it's just lights for that 
not specifically trying to communicate anything to me, but other than like get out of my way or hey, I'm over here type of thing. Yeah, to me, um, to me too. I thought you know this this conveyed I am a an emergency or public service vehicle, and I didn't. Uh, yeah, it, it, the whole coding of it just seemed off. But continue. Sorry, jumping in here. No, no. I mean uh, that's what we're doing this for, right? The and I guess you hit on this, but it, I think it just begs repeating. We're we're always going to get to a point, especially with these advents and all this new tech, especially with AI and automation and vehicles of all kinds. We're going to have to develop new mental models as a culture about how they work and potentially like how we understand what they're doing. Um, but this this particular light patterning just doesn't really match with current things that we have now. Because like it talks about for yielding, it's like slow white pulsing. Where I, I get what it's trying to convey, but in a road context, we usually think of that as like, uh, oh, like a yellow light, even a flashing yellow light, but still something with, there's a color attached to it. It's in a specific position in case people can't see color um, on a light or, and whatnot. So I, I just think there's a, there's more work to be done, but this is a good initial stab in a direction for a lot of reasons. Yeah, I have a couple of ideas on how they could improve this. And if you guys want to hear those ideas, you can join us in our Slack channel. Oh! oh. Oh, look at that. Check that out. Put all his awesome ideas in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we'll check it out on our Slack channel. Ask me about it. <laughs> Be happy to discuss it, but we got to move on cuz we got another story and then we got to hit up some uh it came from Reddit. So, what's up next, Blake? All right, so we'll wrap it up on a good note. I'm trying to learn from past experiences. Thank you. So, this this one is all about Audi. So, this year at the IAA Auto Show in Frankfurt, Audi debuted the Alcon and Elaine, a pair of cars capable of level four automation, claiming that the AI is empathetic to its driver's needs. The idea is that through machine learning, Audi's platform will be able to anticipate what you want before you even ask for it. For example, Audi gives one of its cars suggesting a service, think like Indian takeout or maybe even a spa day and then it books it for the driver like a professional assistant might audi confirmed that the motor authority has converted to be motor authority that could we could soon see these in 2019 and 2020 for the elaine model in production mode now nick we laughed a little bit at the beginning trying to get through this at the top of the show when we were starting it but how would you feel if your car was ordering you food or sending you to the spa i don't like it i don't i don't either it scares me <laughs> yeah so okay so a little backstory behind the scenes pulling back the curtain of human factors cast really quick when i saw this headline i thought oh this sounds great uh, I would love it if, you know, my car could go pick up, I don't know, uh, groceries or something and have it be ready for me while, you know, right as I leave work or something. And what it sounds like is it's it's more of an assistant feature where it will book um, events and, uh, you know, predetermine things that, you know, it can take you there. But it, 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 it it's using machine learning and artificial intelligence to understand what you want. And I just, I, maybe it's our experience with, you know, AI and predictive algorithms to where I just don't think the technology's there yet. Maybe someday it will be wonderful to, you know, walk into my car after work and it just takes me somewhere that I have no idea where it's going. And it's like, hey, you need this. Like, I don't, I don't, I can't ever see me liking that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it it changes how we think about traveling in cars, right? Because may I don't know, maybe I would like that. But it, what it feels like to me is if you had a driver, and you just continually had a schedule that you followed, and you got into a car, and potentially you did work in the back seat, and they knew where to take you. Right, I can see that. It's like your own personal chauffeur. But, yeah, and I mean, it'll interact with you, surely, or I'm. I, this is me assuming, but I'm thinking that it would interact with you like, hey, on Tuesdays, you usually get takeout from this place. Is that where you'd like to go? Something of that nature versus just like, hey, here we go, we're going, and you don't know what you're doing. 
Yeah, I I agree. Um, it's still it's still kind of weird though. Like if it, it with the fully a- autonomous thing, I don't know. I I was once upon a time all about it, but now it's it's starting to uh, I'm starting to push back a little bit. Uh, now that now that you know people companies are thinking of unique interesting ways in which we could use it i i like the idea uh if it works right oh it's it's december you must want to go see a star wars movie yeah yeah it would definitely have you sold yeah no for sure like oh you just hop in the car i'll take you i'll take you you just have to get out and and walk up to the theater and order your tickets and that's it um, I picked up, I picked up your discounted tickets from Costco earlier. Look at that. Uh, oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, so, it would be awesome to have those kind of features. The, the other thing that I thought was pretty cool, at least as far as the implementation of different technologies into your car is I guess Audi has some kind of Audi type of fit system where it can monitor, I guess, different types of biofeedback from you, kind of like your heart rate, how are you breathing, all that kind of right. stuff while you're driving. So let's say you got, maybe if you got into an accident, and the AI, AI was still working, uh, maybe it could assess some of the damage and transmit that. I think that's an awesome application for automation like this. Uh, but again, that's super far out of being at scope probably for this system, but it's just things to think about for the future. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, we got about 10 minutes left, Blake. You want to jump into the It Came From Reddit section? Let's get it, man. All right. So we're jumping into It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. It's our community outreach, um, public service announcements, all that kind of stuff. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community, it's fair game. So we have a couple entries today. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the first one here. This one is uh, some, this is one's on the user experience subreddit from uh, Nasiha. I probably messed that up. But Nasiha asks, is this good onboarding experience? They go on to write, new to the study of user experience, and I find it fascinating. Here's my question. Background. I'm designing a site where users can buy and sell used cell phones. While I'm boarding, I'd like to highlight both the fact that users can purchase as well as list their items. My idea. When users visit the website, not logged in for the first time only, I'm thinking of having a page with the option to both search for cell phones or list their cell phones. The listing option would then start the onboarding process for that. Every time thereafter, they'd be directed to the normal homepage, which is basically comprised of a search bar and a list of most popular items. Question, is this a good UX practice? The idea of having a homepage for first-time visitors and a homepage for recurrent visitors. What are some other ways I can achieve the same thing Blake I'm gonna turn it over to you what what are you thinking about this is it a good idea to have two separate home pages one for the initial visit and one for subsequent visits oh Nick I get to say my favorite phrase that we say every show and it, it depends. depends for sure okay so you know I kind of like the idea of having the two different home pages because let's say all right, let me let me try and back up here. I like the idea of having a home page that introduces a, a site concept to somebody for the first time, and it'll walk them through a specific workflow. In this case, like, hey, you can buy and sell phones, whichever one you want to do. Pick that option, and I'm going to like step you through my onboarding process of getting you set up so you can either buy or sell a phone from my website. And that's another thing. I'm assuming this is just like done through a website not a mobile app, so just trying to keep that in mind as well. Um, and one of my f- favorite things, to be honest with you, Nick, is when I either, either if it's an app or if it's a web page that I go to frequently that's like a product that's like software as a service, like this sounds like it would be, I like going back and not having to go through the same experience before because now I have a little more context of what I'm doing here. Maybe I'm only buying phones. Maybe I'm selling them. I don't want to have to go through the same um, maybe the same pages I went through the first time I was ever here. So maybe if you're, lo- if the user comes to the page and they log in, it takes them to something different. I can see that happening. But in this case, I would ask, um, let me see if I can pronounce the handle. Nasiha. Yeah, I would ask, it. 
what's going on otherwise that you would see on that other on this secondary page you're talking about so the second time they come to the site what are they seeing that's really different from the first because it sounds like that uh, your users when they hit this no matter what they're going to either want to buy sell or some combination of both so you want to ha- give them access to both of those things so i would ask them what the real difference would be yeah before and, making a decision yeah and i think so i think nasiha is uh, definitely getting at the onboarding part of it, right? So how do you how do you get them to click on that? Um, I want to list my cell phone. If you just show them the regular website to begin with, right? So if you if you go to Amazon.com and you want to sell something, it's a little difficult, right? Like how do you how do you even get there? Uh, but it sounds like they want to make this something easily accessible. They want to make a cell phone trade fairly ubiquitous and walk them through the process if they want to, you know, sell their cell phone. Um, now I would, I would look at other e-commerce sites that encourage selling amongst the community. So something like eBay, see what they do. Um, you know, they might have a separate, uh, set up for, uh, selling versus buying. Right. So I just went to eBay I don't see anything that is, uh, well, okay. So here's sell smart, get your phone, get more for your phone. Right. So, uh, there's a, there's a big banner right across the front that says, Hey, see what your phone is worth. So that might be something you can do, um, while still providing like maybe categories down below. Like I, I think it could be, they use it in a, in a carousel, um, on eBay. So maybe that's something that you might want to consider. Um, but just have it like a static advertisement that says, Hey, you can sell your phone here too. Uh, I think once they visited your site, they will understand that it is a two way trading platform where you can sell or buy cell phones, use cell phones. And, um, but, but my, my basic advice is do, do a competitive analysis, see what else is out there. Um, you know, for other platforms that that do allow their users to sell stuff, uh, Etsy is another good example. Um, uh, Etsy, eBay. Can you think of any others, Blake? I know. Uh, there's a actually, few yeah, I was going to draw on. So this would be like kind of an indirect competitor for an analysis like this, but companies like freelancing websites like Nine Nine ah, Designs yes. or uh, Upwork, when they onboard you and this this plays in a little bit differently because people go to those sites they know that what they're there for but the onboarding process is all started in the login so i'm signing up for a login and asks you hey do you want to hire somebody or do you want to be a freelancer for me so that's another model you could use is just getting if if people come to your site and it's clear what they're doing just kind of have them have them register an account and ask them at that point once they give you the information like which one do you do you, or which one are you looking to do and just take them from there yeah i agree but uh i i don't necessarily think two separate web pages is bad i just don't think it's necessary in this in this context um totally agree all right well we wrapped up that one pretty nicely all right uh <laughs> you want to jump into the next one here we got yeah, time for go. i think we got time for one more this one's short and sweet is there anyone in this sub in the user experience sub that originally wanted to be a cognitive psychology professor, but then ended up in UX. And this is, uh, this one submitted by mad neuroscientist. Uh, I best love, name ever. I love the name. I love the name. They want to write. If, uh, I want to know if someone who loves academic research can enjoy a job in industry. And my short answer for that is absolutely. I would say 110% <laughs> yes, and the the best part would be if we could all do both, I think. Or that's that's my opinion. I would love to do both. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it really depends on what kind of work you enjoy. If you really enjoy that kind of seminal, very research-based, um, ph- philosophical uh, concept-based thing, I, you might be better off going into the academic research route but honestly you can you can still do research in industry um you just got to find the right company for it a lot of companies you can do applied research now if you like applied research uh there are plenty of opportunities in um 
in industry. Uh, there are a variety of companies and a variety of my colleagues that I know have actually published papers, uh, even working in, in um, work environments where they're covered under NDA or, uh, you know, very, very secretive sort of uh, industries. Um, I know they have published things on methodology that don't necessarily pertain to their product. Uh, and, and so if you want to sort of go that route, that is one way that you can go. If you like the sort of theoretical behind the scenes uh, exploratory research, maybe you'll have a little bit harder time in industry. But, uh, you know, it, it all depends. It depends. Yeah. On <laughs> <laughs> Twice yeah. in one Reddit. Thing. I know. That's amazing. It, 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 it does really come down to what you're interested in and, and what kind of research you like. So uh, feel free to hit us up and, and, and uh, you know, clarify, and, and we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Blake, do you have any other thoughts on this one? Uh, you know, I would just encourage you to do both. Um, because you're saying you originally want to be a cognitive psychology professor, 100% go do that and enjoy it. But maybe if you're, actually, if you're really interested in UX – Try consulting on the side. Try doing things for free for companies that surround you and see if that really like gets you going like as you're kind of like moonlighting thing while you're a teacher. Um, or even the other way around. Let's say you, you want to hop into a UX research or design job. Go do that and maybe find an online course that you can teach uh, that's related to cognitive psychology. Boom. That's it, man. <laughs> Excellent advice. All right, well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of the stories this week. Did you like all the automated car news? Did you hate it? Let us know. Uh, if you think we missed anything, you can feel you can feel free to send us any suggestions or topics or news stories that you want us to cover. Uh, head on over to our social media. You can find us on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Of course, you can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. You can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. And starting today, you can join us on our Slack channel, which you can find in the show description. Uh, if you want to support us financially, we always love that. You can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you don't want to support us financially and you still listen then here's something else you can do to help us out. You can go and subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We always love seeing those reviews, and we always love seeing good reviews to let us know that we're doing a good job to help you get through the Human Factors News of the Week. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake, thank you for hanging out with me and talking automated vehicles today. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about cars? Ah, such a great show, and thank you to all listeners for taking a, taking the time to hang out with me and Nick this week. And as always, you can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast, and until next time, like Mr. Blake said, it depends! It depends! At least I didn't have to do the outro six times. <laughs>